Hello and welcome to Literary Talks today featuring my friend Gacha Dakuro. Say hello, Gacha Dakuro. Hello, hello, hello. So this is a new kind of video here in my channel, different from what I tried before, where I want to invite guests to share their experiences with the game, as well as which characters they like, which stories they like, why they like that. And maybe we can chat a little bit about lore and character design and all that good stuff. All in all, share our love for the game and for the characters. So, Gacha Dokuro, can you introduce yourself for those who don't know you yet? Sure. Um, hi. As Liri's already said, my name is Gacha Dokuro, or Gacha for short. I am a Verse 1999 content creator who uh, used to put up a lot of shorts, but now I'm sort of pivoting towards uh, long-form videos. Got a lot of cool stuff in the works, a lot of exciting stuff. Hopefully you will enjoy whenever they'll see the light of day and whenever I get off my butt and edit them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let's start with the meat of the video. Uh, how did you get to know Reverse 1999 and which parts of it caught your attention first? Which parts of it do you like the most? That sort of thing. Mm. I remember finding Reverse 1999 through, surprisingly enough, a YouTube ad. I was scrolling through, like, YouTube shorts, you know, doom scrolling for hours and hours and hours because I was procrastinating work. And then the ad for the game came up, uh, and I had, uh, I remember, it was an ad with Arcana. I think that's her name, right? The the, the lady from Man is Vindicte. Yeah, it's Arcana. Yeah, so an ad with Arcana popped up, and it just like caught me by surprise, like how, because usually when I get ads for games on YouTube, it's like, you know, the not not so good games, kind of garbage. Not they're kind of falsely advertising what their gameplay is, but this one kind of took me by surprise with its production value and character designs. So oh, I sure. said, why not? I said, why not? I'll pre-register for the game because I think the game was like a week out from being released. And that's how that's how I found out about the game, literally just from the YouTube ad. I remember uh, some of my friends were very, very confused about Reverse 1999 ads because they didn't know if it was a game, if it was an anime, if it was a movie. <laughs> they right. were very confused, confused because it looked more like an anime ad than a game ad. Right. Like the production value on like the cinematics really took like took me by surprise, and then to find out it was a mobile game, it surprised me even more. Uh, you mentioned at liking the character design and the production value of the game. Who are your favorite characters in terms of design, and as well as just liking them in general? In terms of like purely design. I would say a lot of like the weirder characters really catch my attention. Like I know I kind of uh, <laughs> dunk on her a lot, but TTT was gen was one of the characters that immediately stood out to me. Because it's like, what other game can you play where there's just a, a girl stuck in four different TVs? You know, it, it just because I'm so used to playing games where like uh, like most gacha games where it's just like anime character number 24, but they're in a suit, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I know. I think TTT is one of the designs that caught a lot of attention, as well as Apple and Anite because they are so out there, and Alien T as well. Right. And it's like, you know, Door, uh, Miss Radio, like these very unconventional characters being, you know, in a gacha game was like something that I, I thought it really, you know, had me interested. And anyone else? Um, Voyager, I'd say as well, because just the, the concept of like the space skin, the nebula skin was really like something that I just thought that was such a neat idea. Very pretty, very well executed, I would say. Yeah, she, she does look very pretty. And I do have her here. Oh. Here is Voyager. She's indeed very pretty. Now, uh, one thing that I find very interesting about her design is that a lot of people seem to think that her 
uh, outfit is a made outfit. What do you think about her outfit, her design? I mean, it didn't really strike me as a made outfit because made outfit is usually like more predominantly black, right? And then like white embellishments. So I just kind of thought it was a neat dress, maybe like a performing dress. I don't really know. Yeah, so uh, that was one of the things that caught my attention about Voyager at first, because uh, aside from obviously the space team with her, the way she has stars on the back of her hair and the way her legs are in her inside too. And she has a lot of details on her design and the first one being her dress, which is actually based on the schoolgirl uniform from Soviet Union. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's so, a schoolgirl dress? Yes. So <laughs> you have here the... Oh, wow, it is. <laughs> it's schoolgirl. How do they wear that in the winter? That looks that looks so cold. And here you, you have more. You have options with long sleeves and longer socks for the winter, I guess. Because like Voyager, she has the long socks on her default skin and then on her inside too it's a little bit different because this right. these uniforms they change it over years as well like this one is more like the default voyager they may look vaguely like a maid outfit but they are actually more like a maiden outfit uh you have this picture here from the, I think it was from the late 19th century, early 20th century, if I'm not mistaken. And there was these outfits that, that were made for the girls from nobility to go to school. And when Soviet Union came, they wanted to keep everyone kind of equal, you know. So they made this into everyone's uniform. I was gonna say, so that's what she's wearing? Like, how did she get a, like, why is she wearing a, a Russian, like, school uniform? How did we get a space deity into that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there is the other half of Voyager's character design. Have you heard about the, have you heard about the Voyager program? I know it's very on the nose. Voyager Pro? It sounds familiar. Like, isn't that, wasn't that Russia space, pro spa uh, Russia <laughs> space program? Uh, no, it was actually an American interstellar oh. program. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they had Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, but Voyager 1 is the one who got more famous. Oh, thankfully, this will be edited later. <laughs> Okay, so please don't be alarmed. This is Voyager without her dress. Huh? Oh. <laughs> she, <laughs> she looks like that without her dress. Oh my god, you can't show that on YouTube, Leary. This is all gonna have to be blurred out. <laughs> Demonetized. <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't avoid the joke. So, uh, this is the real life Voyager one. It's only one of the inspirations for Voyager. And the entire point of this Voyager here was because they wanted to take pictures of space and they also wanted to send signals for aliens to enter in contact with Earth and see what Earth is like. Did we ever get anything? <laughs> No, we got some uh, interesting pictures from space. Like, it's a very important program in terms of how advanced it was and how it allowed us to see pictures from the planets. The most famous one being the pale blue dot doing Earth from far, far away. That tiny little pixel is Earth? Okay, uh, yeah. That this tiny, tiny little pizza here is Earth. <laughs> how, do they, how do they know that's Earth? How do we know it's not just like a piece of dust on the lens? <laughs> I think that would be a very funny troll thing to have. 
<laughs> and this is actually like 40 years later. It's like, oh, it turns out it's just a piece of dust on the lens, guys. False alarm, my bad. <laughs> Because they were so happy that they were able to take a picture so far away, you know. Nowadays, if we want to take a picture of moon from Earth, it's already very hard. We need a telescope or something like that. So they built this very powerful telescope to take pictures very, very far away in space. And going back to Reverse 1999, we do have here and her first pic, her first story is about a picture. It, oh! I don't think it's referencing the exact picture because the distance here is a lot bigger. Like it's a 6.4 billion kilometers away. But it does reference Earth and the Voyager 1 picture. And I think the fact that the Voyager 1 picture was known as the pale blue dot is one of the reasons why Voyager's character design is mostly blue and light shades of blue. Oh, because of the pale blue dot. Oh, that's such a cool detail. Well, that's my theory. If you have a theory, of course, uh, feel free to talk because I can ramble a lot when I'm talking about lore and stuff. Honestly, I'm like the most far removed person from the lore. I don't even really know what it happened. And I played through like chapter five recently. I don't really understand what happened. <laughs> Not because of like a lack of understanding or like pay or like reading. It's just I can't like I'm the kind of person where you could put all of the pieces in front of them. But if you don't draw the line between the pieces, I'm going to have no idea what, what any of it means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is talking a little bit about uh, Voyager. As you can see, she's a supernatural work. She's not an arcanist. We don't know what she is really. I like to think that she's the personification of cosmic horror. The personification of cosmic horror, but she's in a school, but she's in a school dress? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is, are they trying to tell us school is the real horror here? <laughs> Maybe. For me, it definitely was. Same, same. I, don't, I don't like remembering those years. Uh, I don't miss school. Stay in school, kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, in, in her second story, we see that some aliens are talking about this very, very scary creature that goes around in space and they try to escape this creature and they don't know what it is they only know that it is like extremely powerful so this story here has such a cosmic horror and eldritch horror vibe and if you pay attention to Uh, Voyager's appearance, both her Udimo on the box and when she first enters battle, it's just a, a mass that looks like a galaxy. Then she takes the form of the schoolgirl. And another curious thing about this, can you guess who was the alien freaking out in this story? Was it Alien T? Yes, it was. <laughs> it was Alien T. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, he seems to have made it out okay, probably. <laughs> probably. We will have to wait for an Alien T video to find it out. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Make sure you saw it for the Alien T video, guys. So, continuing on Voyager here, this is my guess. My, why does why she's she may be that personification of cosmic horror the unknown because of her description as something completely unknown and something very beyond comprehension but also on her items you can see that both on her uh, her three like a set of golden accessories which graces her appearance to quite an extent 
The confusing thing is they are not made of any known material and there are no signs of polishing on the surface at all. And the uniform a casual variant of a school uniform. Similar to the hair accessories, it is also made of an unknown material. So as I mentioned, once Voyager enters, enters battle, at first she appears as a mass without form and then she takes the form of the schoolgirl. So she probably saw some of those uh, schoolgirls from Soviet Union when she first arrived on Earth. And fun fact, these uniforms are from the late 60s and the same time as the Voyager 1 spacecraft. Oh. So she probably saw these girls and since she wanted to blend in and they all looked so happy, she decided to mimic their appearance. Uh, you want to see the item again? Yeah, go back to the item thing real quick. I didn't know this until now, but is that like the circle thing and the number? That's how much sharp a Dante it's worth? Is that what that is? Yes, it is. Oh, I kind of just thought it was... I didn't... Huh. I don't know why it took me this long to figure that out, but I just kind of thought they were just random numbers for some reason. No, th that's the value of each item. I'm going to have to go back through my characters and look at their items, see how much they're worth. <laughs> Because now I'm uh, curious. <laughs> uh, are, you, are you going to sell them? Place them on a pawn shop? I mean, maybe, you know. Huh? <laughs> uh, maybe I can get some decent money out of it. Maybe I'll have enough, you know, sharp boat to actually R10 some of my characters. Please don't, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want a tip, go to Sotheby's profile. Wait, wait, what's on Sotheby's profile? <laughs> I got, wait, I'm going to open the gateway. I got to see what's on Sotheby's profile. Hold on. <laughs> That's because everything Sotheby is wearing is very, very expensive. Wait, really? Well, I, okay, I guess that makes sense because she's like, she has a mansion and everything. But like, I got to see how much. Hold on. Oh, wow. <laughs> 70,000? And Typhon's worth half a cent. Okay. <laughs> wow. Wow, I didn't, I didn't think she was that rich. Jesus. Maybe. Okay, sorry, go okay, on. Okay, so you, you got that already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Typhon is actually a reference to Oswald, who was uh, the character who came before Mickey. Oh, the, 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 the bunny character from like Epic Mickey. Yes. Wait, really? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we are here with extra to be lord despite this not being a sort of video sorry <laughs> I didn't even get a sidetrack i was just <laughs> yeah but uh i don't mind because there are so many interesting details in this game to talk about and discuss yeah there's a lot of like connections and like references that i just did not understand and it's really cool actually seeing like where the connections come from yeah, one thing that I find interesting about uh, Sotheby in particular is, uh, do you know how each of the characters, they are described as a work, kind of like a work of art? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the biggest auction houses in the world and one that is specialized in works of art and works that uh, market history, for instance, they had a Fred Mercury auction with several of Fred Mercury's personal items and stuff like that. So that auction house is Sotheby's. Oh, the auction house is called Sotheby's? Yes, Sotheby is named after the auction house. Whoa, <laughs> wait, that's so cool. Wait, that's it. Wait, wait, that's so cool. Hold on. <laughs> wait, now, now we know where she got all that gold from. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Wait, that's so cool. Oh, sorry. I'm just, I'm just uh, gonna uh, keep saying that. So cool. uh, are you, <laughs> are you cool. searching about the Thirty B auction house online? Yeah, I'm looking at it now. <laughs> wow, that that is so cool. How did like? How, oh my gosh, I don't know how much research went into like 
even just like one of these characters that's absurd that they like were able to like pull that from somewhere oh my wait that's that's oh my god that's so cool sorry i I that like three times in a row but like that's genuinely like the fact that these are so well researched and so well thought out just beyond just like the visual aspect of the character designs but like the lore and like how everything ties together nicely like i didn't really know Sotheby was based off of anyone i thought she was just a just a little alchemist funny girl who just happened to be rich uh no uh in Sotheby's case it was because i happened to see on the news uh when there was uh, a big fred mercury auction and i memorized the name because it caught my attention. I think it was a little bit before the launch of Reverse 1999. So I immediately made that connection. It was pure look in this case. Yeah, that's that's cool. That's real lucky that you were able to like remember that and then just like a few weeks later, like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Voyager, I knew because of studying history. Right. <laughs> I I am a graduate in history, so I'm I'm technically a history teacher, but I don't uh, work with that at the moment. So in reality, this is just like a this is basically a history class. Actually, one of the reasons why I got so much into Reverse 1999 since it is so grounded in real life history, but at the same time, it has its own personality and its own works and it's so unique and the way those two things are intertwined is so, so fascinating to me i i can't ever get enough of researching about these little details and the characters i just thought they were like neat characters <laughs> <laughs> i didn't think much beyond that i'm just like man this character looks really cool <laughs> there is another very important part uh, about voyager so, again, from the point where she's referencing the Voyager 1 spacecraft, and you know, she plays the violin, and you can see here this uh, golden disc on her inside to art. So, the Voyager 1 spacecraft also had a golden disc where they had recorded a lot of things like, a lot, a lot of things like Hello from. Uh, various places on Earth, like from all sorts of languages. And they had music from Earth. They had uh, sounds of animals, sounds of um, how the rain, how volcanoes sound like, how the wind sounds like on Earth. So if any alien picked up this disc, they would be able to listen to what Earth is like. How would they know what to do with the disc? I don't know. They, they are aliens. They, they probably have a way to figure out. <laughs> they just send that out and they're like, let's really hope they have a record player. <laughs> yeah, on Wikipedia, there is this entire article talking about all the pictures and how the disc was made. And there is also an entire list of contents of everything that went into this disc. Oh, wow. It just kept going. It just keeps going. And the coolest, oh, part, wow. <laughs> and the coolest part is, uh, do you know how Voyager almost doesn't speak, right? Mm -hmm. So all the sounds in Voyager, the character, uh, let's go back to her here. Are sounds from the Voyager spacecraft. Like the golden disc? Yeah, they are sounds from the golden disc. Wait, wait, yeah, is that wait, 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 go to go to one of her voice lines. Play one of her voices. I gotta know. <laughs> so uh for instance, here when Pandora asks her, uh, are we interested in anything? And she plays a piece of back. <laughs> <laughs> and here you have uh, the first song here on the golden disc is a piece of Bach. And it's the one she plays. I don't remember exactly which voice line was now. Uh, I will add this information on the edit later. Forte. Piano. <laughs> And 
and mm -hmm. her skills, of course, are also pieces of music from the Golden Disc. But the my favorite part is actually her hobby voice line, because uh, you see here that they had they had the sound of several animals recorded, right? Yeah. And when you go and when you ask, hey Voyager, what's your hobby? She answers. Oof. Meow. Cuckoo. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she just likes animals. She's an animal lover. And that's so cute that the way she has to manifest that is by using the record player from the golden disc with the animal sounds. Could you imagine a conversation like that, though? Like, you know, Voyager walks into a coffee shop, you know, talking to making small talk with the cashier. They're like, oh, you have any hobbies? Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, like stuff you do for fun. Meow. <laughs> Oh no, that's so unfortunate. But I think that's a really cool detail that all the voice lines are from the actual Voyager disc. And it's not like they don't have like options. There's a lot of uh like you like you showed me, the list was big. Yeah, I I don't remember which song is which, but all these songs that she hums or that she like this one. They all are from the golden disc and consequently they all mean something. Like if you check the original song, you will see by the name of the song or whatever, what that song is supposed to mean. And then you can understand what Voyager is trying to say. Oh my God, it's like doing research to figure out what <laughs> she's saying. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I really love all these details that go on it. Uh, have you watched the Bad Apple video? Once upon a time, I did. Long time ago. <laughs> so just to close this part about Voyager and the Voyager spacecraft, her part in the Bad Apple video, it shows the golden disc. Oh, you're talking about the reverse 1999 Bad Apple. I thought you were yeah. talking about the original Bad Apple. <laughs> no, the, the reverse 1999 Bad Apple. That is on my channel. Yes, I did watch that. Yes, that was... Yes, I did watch that. That's... Oh! And that's a very cool detail because at first I didn't know what this was. <laughs> Until I learned it was the the golden disc from Voyager 1. Yeah, I didn't know what that was either. I just kind of thought it was just there to look pretty. Yeah, I was like, okay, they added this cool design here, cool design choice, but it's actually the Voyager golden disc. And it also comes from the connection to Sputnik, which was the relative to Voyager, like while the Americans were working on Voyager, the Soviets were working on Sputnik. And the funny part is apparently the Voyager in reverse 1999 ended up landing on the Soviet Union instead, which I think is a funny twist. Oh, and that's why she wears the school uniform? Yeah, at least that's my, my theory, my headcanon. And I think this is all I had about uh, Voyager for now, at least. Otherwise, this video will get super duper long. And I wanted to add some little things about patch 1.4 as well, since that's where we are now. Uh, so what are you thinking about patch 1.4, all the things that have been added, which are your favorite characters from it? What are your favorite parts of the story? Well, in regards to characters, uh, I really liked, uh, for some reason, like 210 really stood out to me. <laughs> That's quite big. Impressive. Is that his name? 210, the, yeah. the dude who looks like Dionysus. 
Yes. He really stood out to me, especially that part where like Sinetto like passed out and then he had like like brought her outside. That I don't I don't know. Something about that was like, that's really cool. I really like that guy. I really hope he's not just an NPC. I really want him as a playable character. <laughs> and then he didn't become a playable character. <laughs> <laughs> Not even as like a five star. It's so messed up, bro. <laughs> like, uh, since I since one point four came out on the CN server, my sister is waiting for Sophia to become playable, and <laughs> we don't have Sophia yet. <laughs> I was like, for sure, when they release chapter six, we will have Sophia and two ten. Because I was expecting it to be a continuation of chapter 5, but then chapter 6 went on a completely different direction. Well, I don't know. I hope we get, like, a lot of these NPC characters are really cool to the point that I really want them to be, like, playable characters. Like, Lucy? Lucy looks so cool. Like, that, that she's badass. Like, come on! Can't just sideline it like that, please! Oh, Lucy is so important to the story as well. And she's basically holding Laplace together. Otherwise, nobody would be surviving the storm. I hope a future patch will make her playable. But like at this point, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> now, the, um, the only thing about Lucy is that she's clearly a reference to Metropolis, which is basically the the first major science fiction movie from German Expressionists and it's a very very important movie and very very famous about uh, cinephiles but everyone thinks she based it on the Atomic Heart game and it pisses me off <laughs> <laughs> like do you people not know Metropolis? I think Metropolis is a little bit of a deeper cut though you know like the movie because, like, that's from, like, what, the 30s? Yeah, like I said, it was the first uh, major science fiction movie. And both right. both Lucy and Miss New Babel have references to Metropolis. Right. But people are just going to be like, it's the it's the sisters from Atomic Heart, because this is a robot. The dot wall. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... For the other character, I remember you mentioning that you like 37 as well. Yes, 37. She's such a she's such a silly little girl. <laughs> like, do you have a pattern with blue characters? Do you, you think? Know, that... <laughs> I I might. I never really thought about it, but blue has always been my favorite character. I almost said blue was my favorite character. Um, <laughs> blue has always been my favorite color. I remember like being like four years old and playing Sonic all the time when I was a kid. So that might have something to do with it. But maybe I do. Maybe I just really like blue characters, like subconsciously. Right. Uh, now that you mention it, I was thinking about the Nuzlocke challenge and TTT's cards are all blue. Her skills are all blue as well. A lot of her palette is predominantly blue. Yeah, maybe I just have a thing for blue characters where to the point I just kind of gravitate towards it without thinking. I think there is a lot to say about 37 and her design and her quirks, which are a lot of quirks. But I know that uh, Island XD already made a fantastic video about 37, explaining a little bit about her uh, outfit design choices and how she's tied to numbers and such. So I want to talk a little bit about other different things like why does she hate beans? Right, well, what's, what's that about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Personally, I... Do you have Sorry. any... Do you have any theory? I know it's like a thing on a Peron. A Peron? Aperon? The, the island where they're not allowed to eat beans, so it's bigger than like a personal preference to my understanding, but I don't know. I like burritos, so like, you know, I like I kind of need my beans. Sad to me that she doesn't like it. <laughs> so, uh, the Apiron Island and its culture seems to draw a lot from the uh, Pythagorean cult. Uh, the people who follow it, uh, Pythagoras and you may know him for the triangle formula that we learn in school, and please, I don't want to think about school again. Wait, there's a cult around the triangle dude from math? 
Yes, uh, turns out he isn't actually a triangle dude from math. <laughs> Uh, hold on, a, hold on a little bit. I I need to grab a book. Oh, oh God! You books on this? <laughs> yes, I do. I've been reading uh, the history of uh, Pythagoreanism by the Cambridge University. It has a lot of actually interesting articles about this. And be right back. Looking at look at them being all smart and stuff. I don't even read anymore. I just sit in front of my computer and stare at Premiere Pro for hours on end. <laughs> All right, and the funny thing about uh, Pythagoras, and this is a quote from Geoffrey Lloyd. It says, should Pythagoras be considered a mystic, a sage, a religious leader, a charismatic figure, a guru, a magus or magician, a wonder worker, a shaman, a, ph a philosopher, a cosmologist, a mathematician, a scientist, uh, the scholarly literature is full of attempts to shoehorn him in one or another, or more often into a combination of such categories. But they never reached an agreement on what Pythagoras actually was, or if he even existed. He was just this crazy dude that was more like a mystical being than a person. He's just a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and all we know him for is his, like, math formula. Uh, nowadays, we know him for more things. Actually, we knew him for more things, but we forgot, and then we remembered again 50 years ago. What do you mean we forgot? <laughs> Wait, what happened 50 years ago? Okay, so... <laughs> Sorry, time. Pythagoras created the... Uh, scale for the musical scale, the first musical scale that people used to create music and play music, or at least that's what the story says. The, the problem is the way he created his scale, since he wanted everything to m match in terms of perfect mathematical numbers, he didn't want any irrational numbers in his musical scale, so he made a scale only with perfect numbers. And at first, this was the scale used, and it kind of worked fine, but some notes didn't work so fine, and it made music something super tricky. And it was like that until, I think it was during the 18th or 17th century, when someone created the modern musical scale that we use nowadays. And it turns out that the modern musical scale is almost completely made of irrational numbers, which Pythagoras would, would have hated. <laughs> and I kind of love this because we have Regulus, who is a, a character entirely focused on music, and she is an irrational number. Oh. <laughs> it's been such a long time since I've, like, used any of these terms that I, like, have to remember what they are. Oh, it's these. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, go on. Yeah, I'm not gonna try to explain rational numbers and irrational numbers or anything like that here because I suck at mathematics. So I'm gonna focus on the funny story part about yeah, yeah. Pythagoras. And okay. he did a lot of things, like he was known for... There are stories about how he was able to be at two places at, at the same time for his lectures. Uh, he was also known for loving triangles and everything with a uh, triangular shape. And you can see that in 37 as well. That tracks. <laughs> yeah, one of my uh, personal headcanons is that 37 is partially inspired on Pythagoras himself because a lot of her personality quirks match with his. Uh, like the way she's kind of aloof to the world, and how she sees everything through forms and numbers only. It kind of matches with the 
uh, stories we have about Pythagoras. But then we also have how Pythagoras killed a, a giant snake by biting it. He killed a giant snake by biting it? Yes, it, he was that hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> so that's wild. <laughs> and do you know what that makes me think of? <laughs> A 37 biting Regulus. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Oh my god, so Regulus is a giant snake. It's been confirmed, guys. That's crazy. <laughs> no, because the the snake is the symbol of evil, right? And irregular right. numbers, irregular numbers are the symbol of evil for the Apiron and for 37. So she's biting Regulus, like Pythagoras did with the snake. Oh, that's that's so big brain. How did? <laughs> There's so many connections. I just thought it was just a funny little thing. I mean, it could be just a funny little thing, but I I like to make up these crazy theories. I choose to believe your theory. You know, I'm not going <laughs> to fact-check anything. I just, I'm going to start believing people. <laughs> okay, so back to the beans. I, I think this will be the, the last topic. Otherwise, this video will become way, way too long. So oh there are several reasons why he may have hated beans. Uh, beans in the ancient societies, this wasn't limited to Pythagoras only. In Greece, ancient Egypt, Rome, all these uh, ancient societies, they only had access to fava beans. Fava beans are those very big ones. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> and They're huge. Yeah, they are not only huge, but they also have kind of uh, two problems. One is cereals, and the other is, I find it more funny, almost like a joke. Which one do you want to hear first? Uh, let's hear the funny one. Okay, so just leaving Pythagoras here to illustrate. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so in the ancient times, there was this belief that beans were tied to the, uh, were a representation of, they contained the souls of people, like the really? souls of the dead. They just thought fava beans were like the souls of the dead? Yeah, because they were fleshy-like and because the plant they come from has a... It has a shape that is empty inside, so it, it's kind of like a portal to Hades. So they had this connection, this weird connection between souls of people and beings. And Pythagoras in particular, and this is something for the Pythagoreans only, he believed that every time you farted, you, you were farting your life force your soul <laughs> and if you eat many beans you fart a lot so eating beans is no good that means you will die faster <laughs> oh my god <laughs> i'm so sorry it's such a it's such a odd like i, I <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> it doesn't like beans because it makes you fart and if you fart you die. <laughs> no more farting! You're gonna die! No more farting! Stop! It's <laughs> such a it's such a it's such an odd belief, but like I guess if I lived in Greece I would also believe that. You know, it's like, yeah, it seems that seems legit. I I would I trust that. Well, that seemed legit to them because there is a little allergy to fava beans in particular, and it seems it was relatively common at the time. So a lot of oh. people did die after eating beans, which probably oh. is how this <laughs> spread. That's so unfortunate. <laughs> Death I'm by glad beans. It's not a thing anymore. And the the cereals reason why they are tied to 
the souls of the dead and also taken as a symbol of death and such is because their shape and size was believed to be the same as the human fetus. And if you compare the picture of the beans and the picture of the fetus, they, they are kind of similar. They have this bean shape. So they had this image in mind that if you are eating beans, you are sort of committing cannibalism, which, which was wild. Oh. 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 Ah, okay. Okay, okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. And the third and final reason that I have, like, there are many, many theories, but I think these are the three main uh, accepted ones. It's because the beans were also used in, uh, sometimes they were used to cast votes. Like, you know, uh, ancient Greece had its city-states and people could vote there. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and the Pythagoreans were they they were against that they were against uh, voting they were really? they preferred oligarchies so uh, not not eating beans and prohibiting beans was kind of sort of a political rebellion like we are not touching that stuff we don't agree with it. So just straight up, we're not eating beans. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Where are you it's going just, with, with this theory? <laughs> it's just, it's just silly that <laughs> it's just kind of silly that like as like a political move, they're like, we're not eating beans, guys. No more fava beans. <laughs> that compounded with everything else. I can kind of see where they're coming from with like the. Like why, you know, they don't eat beans. It's just kind of unfortunate when you put it all together. Do you think 37 also believes that if you fart, you're like losing a bit of your life force? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Because, yeah, because there is also this other belief that if something falls on the ground, and this one I find wild as well, you can't pick it, you can't pick it back up. Because if yeah, some, if if something falls on the ground, then that was a, a bad omen because that thing was now closer to Aegis. So if oh. you if you try to pick that thing on the ground, you are dragging yourself closer to death as well. Oh, I that's think what that is. Yeah, I think there was a scene, I don't remember now if it was with Sophia or Verting when something does fall on the ground and 37 tells to not pick it up. I don't remember who it happened with, but I just remember it happened and just thinking like, why is that a thing? Why, why are they? Yeah, so it is a thing because if you are lowering yourself to the ground, you are to pick something that has fallen. It's like you are pursuing that bad omen of being dragged to death. It kind of makes sense, but at the same time, I think it's a little bit extreme. Because imagine if you are someone clumsy who keeps dropping stuff all the time. Right, that's what I'm saying. Like, I have butterfingers. If I drop it, like, <laughs> it, it's over. Imagine every, like, imagine every time you drop your phone, you have to buy a new one because you can't pick the one you drop it. Right, that's what I was going to say. You drop your wallet with, like, all of your important stuff in it. Oh, can't pick that up anymore. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> <laughs> so, those were the... A uh, lot of bits I had to say about uh, 37 and about Voyager. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope this makes you enjoy your experience with the game even more. It definitely makes me appreciate the character design a lot more. Because, like, I already really like the character design in this game. It's just, like, elevated now. It's like, whoa, they did this because of this and because of this. You know, I just love the characters more now. And if anyone is watching this video and knows more curiosities about Voyager or 37, or if you want to 
have a video about a specific character or if you want to be a guest in this series of videos you can comment down below or contact me directly thank you all for watching if you came to this far and get the cura do you want to leave a message for everyone who is watching us yeah um if you like this kind of content uh, hit that join button on Leary's channel so you can become a member and support them monthly so that they can keep putting out good content like this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. I really appreciate that. Okay, so uh, Gacha Dukuro's information as well as all links to his channel will be on the description as well as the pinned comment. They make amazing and funny content, so be sure to check that out as well. And see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.